This recording is protected by copyright. No part may be reproduced without the prior permission of the University of South Australia. Good evening. My name is Jacinta Thompson and I'm the Executive Director and Exhibitions Producer for the Bob Hawke Prime Ministerial Centre. Before we begin, I would like to acknowledge that the land we meet on tonight is Ghana land and we wish to express our respect for the Ghana people, their elders and ancestors and to acknowledge the spiritual and cultural relationship that Ghana people have with their land. It gives me great pleasure to welcome you all here tonight on behalf of the Hawke Centre and the University of South Australia to our presentation with award-winning journalist Andrew Quilty as he discusses his new book, August in Kabul. Tonight, Andrew will be in conversation with fellow award-winning journalist, Professor Peter Grester, and I warmly welcome you both to Adelaide and to the Hawke Centre, and thank you for joining us. I would also like to thank the publishers from Melbourne University Publishing for their work in providing um, a wonderful platform for such engaging and thought-provoking authors and thinkers. The Hawke Centre is committed to delivering a diverse program, and I must say free and diverse program of events and exhibitions throughout the year which reflect our fundamental themes of strengthening our democracy, valuing our diversity and building our future. Andrew Quilty has established himself as one of Australia's great war reporters. He is the recipient of nine Walkley Awards, including the Gold Walkley, for his work in Afghanistan, where he had been based since 2013. He has also received the George Polk Award, the World Press Photo Award, and the Overseas Press Club of America Award for his investigation into massacres committed by a CIA-backed Afghan militia. Please join me in a very warm welcome to Andrew Quilty and Professor Peter Grester in what promises to be a very insightful and engaging conversation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jacinda. It's fantastic to see such uh, a huge audience and get such a very warm welcome. And it's also an incredible honour to be sharing the stage with Andrew Quilty. Um, Andrew is honestly a kind of journalist journalist. Um, Jacinda said he's, he's an award-winning journalist. Um, that's probably a bit of an understatement. He's probably got more gongs for his pool room than, than, than a few, a few uh, world-class footballers I know. Um, and I, it, it's, it really is wonderful to, to, to be here to, and, and to read Andrew's extraordinary book. It's a fantastic read and I'd really encourage you to get a copy uh, once we're done. Andrew. I guess the first question, the obvious question, the question that I was often asked when I went to Afghanistan was, was why? Why Kabul? Why did you end up there? Well, when I went, I didn't have any intention of staying more than a couple of weeks. I, I, I went there with a, a friend with whom I'd worked at uh, Fairfax in Sydney who, who wanted to go and write a story on spec about the Afghan cricket team as they prepared to um, compete in their first Afghanistan's first ever World Cup in Australia the next year, and she asked me if I knew any photographers that she could work with um, in Afghanistan for some other stories she wanted to do in, um, in uh, the Middle East. And without thinking too much about it, I said, I'll, I'll come. And um, so we booked, uh, we booked tickets for, for two weeks, and um, you know, the, 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 the wheels of um, bureaucracy uh, moved pretty slowly in, in Afghanistan, and so the, all the permissions and things we needed to do the work we wanted to do um, saw us extending and extending and extending, and then eventually we started extending by our own, our own volition because we were enjoying ourselves, and we, so we stayed out the three months our visas allowed us, and by the end Hang of on, that time... You, start, you went for two weeks and you stayed at least three months? Yeah. And, yeah, uh, How I mean, did you explain that to the office? <laughs> no, well, okay, sorry, we, we were both freelance. Okay. 
So it was all, um, yeah, it was all on spec and it was all on our own time and dime. Um, and yeah, the office definitely wouldn't have been happy if, if I had had an office, they wouldn't have been happy but knowing that I stayed there for nine years <laughs> eventually. But, <laughs> but um, yeah, no, we did, well, I fell in love with the place and by the end of that three months, I, I um, packed up my things back home and, and moved over, to, over there indefinitely. It's a pretty appealing place for a photographer, isn't it? Very much so, yeah. I mean, um, even if the place was devoid of, of uh, humans, it, it, it's a spectacular landscape. And it's, um, I mean, Kabul itself, it's, it's 2,000 metres above sea level. And then on top of that, you've got, you know, five to 6,000 metre mountains, you know, almost um, snow-capped almost all year round. And you've got that, you know, the, the, the dust that hangs in the air and coats everything. Um, and the, the smoke during the winter from wood burning fires and this um, you know, vestiges of this you know, very old old culture that is you know has in, in recent decades tried to tried to come out of it, but you know still there's a there's a lot um, of that of that history that is very appealing to a photographer. There's also one of the things that you notice that when you look at the photographs is, is the really direct way that Afghans seem to engage the lens in a way that when you're photographing people who are more familiar with images, who are surrounded by images, tend not to. And I've always found that when you take photographs of, of Westerners, everyone's posing, everyone's trying to project an image, whereas in Afghanistan, Africa, mm -hmm. they really connect with the lens, don't they? Yeah, it's almost like a, an, an instinct here and in the West to, I mean, at the very least, smile when a camera's pointed at you. I mean, nowadays, it's, that the smile is taken to a whole different level. But, um, but yeah, in Afghanistan, it's, and, you know, this is probably to an extent because um, they have been deprived of the kind of development and technology that has produced those kind of um, cultural results in, in places like Australia and, and so it's you know in, in a way it's it's taking advantage of that as a photographer but at the same time it's, it's hard to ignore it because it is I mean it's that that look that a portrait of photographer is always wanting of, of their subjects that you know just almost looking through the lens and through your eyes and out the back of your head and um, it's it's very again another um, uh, and one of the many reasons that Afghanistan is such a compelling place as a photographer. It was one of the reasons. What were some of the other reasons that you decided to stay? Um, well, I think what, what you can't see in a photograph is... Um, in Afghanistan is, is far more than what, what you can see. And, and so I've, I found that um, although, on the one hand, you had these very... Um, spectacular, um, aesthetically beautiful images to take. What, what was behind those and what was beyond the, the frames of the, of the photograph was just as necessary to, to include in the, in, in the um, I mean, whatever, whatever that is, the, the, I don't know if there's a name for it, you know, the, the photo and everything that surrounds it, the, the context, I mean, a caption is the easiest way to describe it, which but, but um, you know, the embellishments that are historical and cultural embellishments that a, a physical photograph have in a place like Afghanistan are extraordinary. Where, you know, you, you just can't, you can't point a camera in any direction in that country without capturing, um, you know, the sites of, of great historical importance. Yeah, there's something really profound. I mean, you, you, you're kind of constantly reminded, aren't you, that everywhere you go, there's, Pete, there, there's Genghis Khan and there's Alexander the Great. Their legacy's still there. You stub your toe on this, on some of these, these old relics from time to time. Exactly, you? yeah, and it's very accessible as well. I mean, and again, that's it's probably... Um, to the detriment of the country that, that, you know, these historic sites, you can literally go and, you know, walk up the, the steps where Genghis Khan walked and, you know, take a stone home and put it on your mantelpiece or whatever. Um, but all, you know, there's no sort of... And you, you see this photographing sport there, you know, there's no boundary line, lines or ropes, you know, you can just... You're totally immersive there. Um, you spent a lot of time, obviously, working on, around the war, was there an approach that you took 
to covering this story? Was there, was there a kind of guiding philosophy that you had in, in covering the country? Not in the beginning, no. I mean, it took me a, f a few years to probably work that out and then and discover the sort of themes that um, started to st stand out to me. Um, and that, that probably came in 2015 when, um, yeah, I mean, it, the, the, there was a, what happened that year, late that year, um, a couple of years after the international combat mission had, had largely wound down and, and uh, responsibility for Afghanistan security had been handed over to the Afghan government and their security forces. And with that, the Taliban had taken advantage and were um, really putting pressure on the, on the government and their security forces. And in September 2015, um, they overran the first city that they, um, that they had in, in, since uh, the American invasion in 2001, a city called Kunduz in the north. And um, uh, the Americans were involved in trying to recapture this city to return it to government hands, and, and in doing so, they, uh, with one of their warplanes, destroyed a, a hospital run by Doctors Without Borders and, and killed more than 40 of their patients and staff. And um, and I, I I managed to get into the hospital um, that that had been sort of it was still in in Kunduz at the time was still being fought over and. There were no journalists there, and I managed to get inside and, and um, took some photos that. Sorry, no, no go yeah. on. I, I know where you're headed with yeah, this. Yeah, I mean, took some photos that um, of the, uh, the, the civilians who had, through no fault of their own, been caught up in this war and and suffered the ultimate price, and and that kind of became the the theme of my work for the for the rest of my time there. And in fact that one of the civilians who paid the price, the ultimate price, was a man that you photographed on an operating table in that hospital. That was the photograph that won you the Gold Walkley Award and a, bunch of whole, a whole bunch of other prizes. It is an extraordinary photograph. It is not in the exhibition. But can you tell us about how you came on that, that photograph? Um, yeah, it's, it's a bit of a long story, but I mean, I, I was in... Well, you're in, I mean, yeah. you've taken us to the hospital. The yeah. hospital's been attacked. Mm -hmm. You're photographing it. I think, as, as I understood it, for the pretty much for the record, you're, you're actually just trying to document what happened there rather than mm. taking photographs for as a journalist. Is that right? Yeah, uh, to an extent, because the, no one had been inside the hospital yet, and it was it was clear by this stage that it was a it was a pretty significant um, moment in the war, and and most likely a, a huge mistake, if not a um, a, a war crime. Um, carried out by the American um, Air Force. Um, so the, just to be clear, the American Air Force had targeted this particular hospital. Yeah, that's right. Do you know why? Well, it's still unclear. I mean, they, they claim that it was a, um, a case of mistaken identity, that they had, they, that they had um, wanted to target a, an adjacent building, but um, that this was the one that ended up um, coming under barrage for about an hour. And, um, and yeah, it was... Um, I felt, um, I guess I, I felt like my responsibility there um, was as much as a, 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 an individual journalist as it was a, you know, a record keeper because this was going to be probably the subject of numerous investigations, maybe war crimes trials and, and so on. And so I, I really went in there, not with my, so much with my photographer's hat on, but as a, like a forensic, um, uh, a criminologist or something, and I, so I w went in and I just said, "I'm going to go into every room, and I'm going to stand in the middle and and pivot in the middle, take a photo of, of every surface, basically." And so I did that, and I I was pretty conscious of um, very conscious of my surroundings at the time. There was still fighting going on out in the streets, and I was pretty isolated there. I had a a, a driver who who'd driven me in, who was waiting for me. Um, so we were isolated, and so I said, I'll give myself 15 minutes. And of course, 15 minutes, it was like my, uh, my overall time in Afghanistan, 15 minutes turned into half an hour into 45 an hour, hour and 15 minutes. And, and by then, you know, the sun was coming down. I really needed to get out of the city before it was dark. And um, 
um, before I left, I just saw there was one wing of the hospital that I hadn't been into, and it didn't look that damaged, and I th but I thought, oh, I better go and have a look, and so I went in, and the first room I walked into was an operating theatre, and after my eyes adjusted to the light, I could see that the sort of outline of a, an operating table, and, and then I realised there was a man, or a, a body that was on top of the table, and he was still strapped to the, by his um, wrists to the table, and... Um, had the, um, the exoskeleton on, on his um, thigh, which was going to be removed and stitched up. And, um, and so I thought, and, and it was at that point that I, th I kind of switched from the, the forensic um, photographer to the, to the journalist, because I saw that this was a particularly um, a, a significant scene. This is a re that was a really powerful moment. You, did you realise at the time how important that photograph would be? Oh, no, not quite, but I could see that this was going to be... Uh, compared to the rest of the photos I'd taken in there, that I knew this was a bit different and that it re represented something. Because I think serious. that's it, isn't it? That as a photographer, you know, as a journalist, what you're always looking for are those moments that really encapsulate so much of the things that you're trying to articulate, the pathos, the human cost, the tragedy of the conflict, the the scale of the crime and everything, all of those things are wrapped up in that, in that one really powerful image combined with, dare I say it, a, a real sort of sense of, of, of art. I don't mean to diminish what the photograph or, what, or, the, or the, the victim there, but there is something really compelling about that image. Yeah, and that's, that's always a, a fine line, isn't it? Um, you know, beautifying tragedy and, um, I mean, not that this photo is particularly beautiful at all. I mean, the light's kind of horrible, and it's, I mean, it's like a, it's a dingy scene, and, um, but it's, I, I suppose there's some um, symbolism in there. He's, he's sort of out like this, you know, almost Christ-like, and um, I mean, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's a hard line to walk that, because as a photographer, you have that instinct to, um, to, to compose elements in a in a scene into a into such a way that they make a beautiful photograph but you also yeah you don't want to sort of overdo it I, I don't want to dwell too much on this but i think it is important just to finish this narrative off you did follow up you did find out what who he was and, and what happened to him can you just explain to our audience the, the, just the background very briefly yeah, it, it, it turned out that he um he was a father of four and he um he was shot in, in crossfire uh, a few days earlier when he was going to um, his place of work. He, he was a security guard at, outside some jewellery stores and, and got caught in crossfire and um, had been rushed to the hospital. And, you know, it was, by Afghan standards, it was a very a simple wound and um, he had one operation. He was in a, a, for a couple of nights and then he was going to, after this surgery, that would stitch him up and he would have been on his way the next day. Um, and, yeah... Obviously, that didn't happen. And that was when the attack happened. He was laid out. He was unconscious at the time. He was, yeah, under general anaesthetic, and he had. Um, I spoke to some of the surgeons and, and um, medical staff around him at the time, and they just said, I mean, he was a, you know, a, a hundred kilos of, of dead weight, um, incredibly difficult to move um, under the circumstances. He had a huge, you know, open wound. And the hospital was under, you know, ferocious bombardment, and, and um, they had to they had to leave him there um, and, and hope for the best. I want to move on to talk about the book, in, very specifically. But one of the things that you made very clear in the book was that the one that we have here, this particular book, wasn't the one that you started to write. We'll come to this in a moment, but I think it is worth talking a little bit about the book that you originally wanted to write and, and just explain what it was that you had started to do. The book I'd initially thought of writing was going to follow on from that, that what I saw as a central theme of the, of the war um, or a tangent that ran off it, that being the, um, the way the international military mission undermined the, the greater mission of you know, bringing democracy to Afghanistan and um, development and modernity and things. Um, because of the, the, the blunt violence that was used and the, and the, and the tactics that ended up turning 
um, enough of the population against the government and the international mission um, that they were able to ultimately overthrow the government. And, um, and, and so I, I wanted to t tell a, um, a story from the, the personal perspectives of some of those um, who had been um, brought into the war for, for those kinds of reasons. That wasn't the book that you, you wrote, but there are a couple of points that you referenced that. And one of the things that you said is the Taliban recruitment seemed to rise in proportion to American aggression. At first, there was no support for the Taliban, a low-level commander from Maidan Wardak told me in 2020. It was when the Americans started killing civilians that people started supporting us, giving us food, bullets, and offering men. Would more restrained battlefield tactics, do you think, have changed the outcome of the war? Well, I mean, to be honest, I, I don't know how you conduct a war um, without, you know, the, banging a cake, you're going to break some eggs, right, to use a very crude analogy. Um, and war is a, a messy, imprecise business. And, I mean, despite all the technology that goes into particularly American defence spending, um, you know, the, the, a, Afghans, particularly in rural areas, they would always say to me, you know, the, the Americans can see, you know, the, the, what's written on my cigarette packet from, from the sky. And, I mean, that's not quite true, but it's not that far off it. And they, and, and so what, you know, you know why, why do these incidents happen? Why do they bomb, the host, bomb a hospital? Why do they bomb a, a, a wedding? So they start to think it's deliberate. And, um, and when, you know, that it's intentional. And um, so, I, look, I, I just don't know. I mean, it, it, was, it was particularly airstrikes and, and night raids that were most um, seen as most egregious by the, particularly the rural population. And even to the, uh, Af the, the first uh, Afghan president post-2001, Hamid Karzai, who, who railed against the um, uh, US military tactics and, and in the province you're talking about, Maidan Wardak at one point kicked out the um, American special forces because of you know constant complaints about their behaviour, and um, I mean it, measures were brought in by, um, for example, uh, an American general bought, established a, a a medal, an award, a, a, a military medal um, for what he termed courageous restraint, meaning if you were in a um, in a, in a combat situation, and you, rather than fire, a, fire your, your weapon, you, you put it down um, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a way that would, um, you know, perhaps um, prevent the, the kinds of um, civilian casualty incidents that were causing all these kinds of problems, you would be rewarded for that. And the soldiers hated this, and they felt like they were fighting with their hands tied behind their back. And um, I mean, so th th there was some, there was certainly some acknowledgement of, of these problems. Um, but I, I just, I, I think that the difference between, and you know, this is very easy for me and human rights defenders to, to talk about from the safety of, of Kabul or here. Um, but you know, you get young men with, um, who are being, you know, being shot at and have had their friends blown up by improvised explosive devices. I mean, they're not thinking about the, the, wider, um, the wider picture, about you know, fighting for democracy, about um, you know, how, how their actions are going to be perceived back home, or the reports they're going to end up on by Human Rights Watch or Amnesty. They just want to get out of there alive and, and protect the, the men either side of them. You're being very, well, I was going to say you're being very generous towards the, the soldiers. I mean, we know from some of the reporting we've seen on the ABC, Mark Willisey, who interviewed you back in Brisbane, um, has exposed some pretty horrendous abuses by Australian soldiers. And I know what you're saying about a lot of these young guys, but in the case of the reports that Mark was uncovering, we're talking about the SAS, the guys who are supposed to be the elite, the most professional, most restrained, the most targeted, the guys who know how to switch it on and off. Are you being a bit generous? Well, no. Um, I mean, I've, I've written about these these kinds of incidents myself, absolutely. And I'm 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 talking about the cases where, um, uh, you know, the the kind of 
fog of war kind of incidents. But yes, absolutely, there were there were um, so soldiers, entire units that were out of control and without a doubt turned um, proportions of the population against, against them. Because it wasn't always that way too. I mean, I remember I was in Afghanistan in 2001 after the fall of Kabul. Um, and I remember then just the sense of, you know, obviously there were Afghans and particularly Afghans in rural areas who saw the Americans as invaders. But at the time, a lot of people were fed up with the Taliban too. They, they, did not, they were not sorry to see the Taliban go. There was a lot of hope, a lot of optimism back then. Yeah. There was a window of opportunity to make this work, wasn't there? Yeah, there was, absolutely. I mean, you can probably talk to this better than I can, because, um, but, but yeah, you're absolutely right. And, and having said that, um, when the Taliban arrived in, in Kabul in 96, there was, uh, my understanding is they were welcome to an extent, extent as well, because the, the, the Mujahideen groups who came before them were so intolerable. And this is actually something I, th I did want to talk to you about. Um, because I, as you said, I, I was actually in Kabul in 1995. I was a BBC correspondent back then, and, and I saw the Taliban when they, they first emerged in 1994, and they arrived on the outskirts of Kabul in 1995. And I think it's interesting that we, we often demonise the, the Taliban as if these, as these kinds of crazy ideological um, is, Islamist militants, without really understanding where they came from. As you said, they did come from a place of of anarchy, where the warlords had, had torn the country apart in the wake of the departure of the Soviets. Um, did you have any sympathy at all for the, for the Taliban's mission? Yeah, I did. Um, I, and that shouldn't be confused with sympathy for their ideology or yeah. the way that they um, dictate power now, but absolutely, I mean, I just, you know, put myself in their shoes. If I'd grown up in a, a rural community in Western New South Wales and the Taliban invaded Australia and, and, and kicked in the door to my mother's home, my sister's home, and you know, dragged my, my, my you know, brother away and threw him in prison in, in Kabul, like, what would you expect me to do? But even more than that too, if you roll the, the clock back, I remember the Taliban emerged when I, as I could see, as a, as, a, as a response to the anarchy that the warlords had imposed. And what they did was that they reached for the only thing that they knew would create order, and that was Sharia law, that was the Quran. Um, and that became the organizing philosophy for the organization in a place where there was no organizing philosophy anywhere apart from the self interest of the warlords. So at least I could see and understand where that ideology came from, how they'd come to be where they were. The one thing that always struck me when I was in Afghanistan was the, the fact that there was two, at least two distinct strands. It wasn't a monolithic organization, that there were the ideologues, the ones who are the real hardliners, and the pragmatists, the guys who sort of were more willing to engage and be flexible and negotiate. Again, did you find that with the Taliban? We often talk about as if it's this one organisation mm. with one single philosophy. I think you're seeing that now, where you have the the, the original founders um, from mostly from southern Afghanistan, um, Kandahar, Aruzgan, Helmand, um, who are who, who are now. Um, I mean, that's the sort of southern Kandahar faction, and then you have the Haqqanis, um, who are, you know, the east. in the east, and I mean, equally ruthless, and, and were responsible for, you know, some horrific violence over the course of the war. But they are now advocating for, for example, um, women's education or, or um, high school education for girls. And you know this is all behind the scenes, and they're trying to trying not to let um, the internal feuding spill out into the public. But it, there's no doubt this is happening behind the scenes. Yeah. Yeah. That you get the guys that are reasonably well educated, because a lot of the Taliban actually are reasonably well educated, and and then there are the guys who come from the villages who've mm -hmm. gone straight into as as soldiers mm -hmm. and been indoctrinated in that way. And there's a lot of there is a, there is a division there. Yeah, very and, much and so. An internal debate. Um, did, 
Was this ever going to be seen as anything other than an occupation then by, by the West? Well, again, I mean, um, Afghanistan, Afghans are not monolithic either, so it obviously depends who, who you ask. Mm -hmm. um, I think, and you know, this, this is a, a somewhat of a generalization, but you can look at the difference between the urban and rural um, populations, and, and I think, in the um, in the in the rural areas, it was I think it was pretty difficult for people not to see the the international mission as as an occupation. I mean, they they were there ostensibly on the invitation of the the central government, but the central government didn't really represent people in in rural areas. It certainly didn't represent them well, um, and. Um, I guess in the in the more urban areas where um, a lot of the, the benefits of the past 20 years were were felt um, with you know new roads and, and buildings and and jobs and general prosperity and investment and um, and, and a lot less of the um, uh, militarization and a lot less of the war um, it, it's funny but the story you're telling sounds a lot like the Soviet occupation. Yeah, you know? it really does. I mean, <laughs> and you know, the, yeah, the Soviets brought in education and healthcare and built roads and built bridges and, um, but yeah, the, you know, they were our, our enemy at the time. And I, I wasn't planning on asking this question, but I remember a discussion that we had with some of our Afghan translators when we were in Kabul once and we were talking, we were doing some Monty Python sketches and you might remember, anyone who's seen Life of Brian will remember these guys sitting around talking about the Romans and one guy says, oh, what did the Romans ever, ever bring for us? And the other guy says, well, education, roads, health. <laughs> and we were talking about the Russians and, and the Afghans were getting really dirty. They did not get the joke. <laughs> but yeah, it depends which Afghans you talk to because they're, I mean, you, you can pick them to, to this day, the, the Afghans who, um, who benefit from the Soviet times. They, all, they wear must big thick moustaches, mm. the men anyway, um, and, <laughs> and, and, and they, you know, a lot of them speak Russian and, um, you know, there is that segment of the, and, and, and they made up a lot of the um, security forces this time around after 2001 because they'd had that training and, and education and, yeah, cycles. We don't seem to learn. Um, I, let's talk about the fall of Kabul itself now. Um, it's become a bit of a cliche to say that we should have seen it coming, but even you didn't see it coming, did you? Not at the speed that it came eventually, no. I, I, I mean, for me, the writing was on the wall. I mean, the writing was probably on the wall in as far back as 2014. Um, you say that, but did you see it in 2014? It, w it was a matter of when, not if, at yeah. that point, I think, when I, in hindsight as well. But um, it w in uh, February 2020, the Americans signed a, a deal with the, with the Taliban, excluding the Afghan government from, from um, negotiations with that agreement. And it was pretty much from that moment on that I thought this is, and, and I think it was widely viewed this way, that this, I mean, they've, they've just sort of set the, the clock um, to countdown, and I mean the, the countdown that they they had um, officially set was for the withdrawal of, of American and, and by default all international forces, um, which was to um, assuming that um, the next administration after um, Trump was not re-elected um, followed on with the deal would um, would honour it um, uh, 18 months further down the track and. And that made it very clear that all the Taliban had to do was wait then? Certainly from their point of view. I mean, yeah, the Taliban, there were victory parades in, in Taliban-controlled areas after the signing of that agreement. Um, and, um, yeah. But it was, but when I say you didn't see it coming, I, I, I know that we all, we could all see generally that, that this whole project was going to collapse and the Taliban would ultimately probably enter Kabul either through an agreement or by force. But when it finally happened, you were out of the country mm -hmm. at, at a friend's wedding mm -hmm. in France. Yeah, you're right. I mean... You had to scramble. Yeah, I, I, 
yeah, as you said, I was at a wedding, and on on the day of the wedding, on I think it was August sixth, um, and and I was there with a bunch of uh, friends from Afghanistan. The the couple um, who were being married had met in Afghanistan, and um, so we we're all. Uh, you know, getting, <laughs> drinking our Aperol spritz or whatever we were, and, <laughs> and you know, all of a sudden everyone looks at their phones and the, f the first um, uh, provincial capital had fallen to the Taliban. And you all thought, you know, it, it, the Taliban had been on a romp in the, the months before, but it had been all rural, like very rural areas. But by this time, they kind of had the provincial capitals surrounded. And so the first of 34 provincial capitals had fallen. We sort of stopped for a minute and we thought, okay, well, it's not a strategically significant city, it's all right, and then continued on and then, you know, woke up the next day and two more cities had fallen. And then I think there was a break and then the, the, on the fourth day, three cities fell. And, um, yeah, I, I was sort of hanging out in, in Paris. I was, you know, doing, having some meetings with clients and things and, and it got to the point on um, the 12th of August, I was out having a, a, a dinner and drinks with a, with a friend and she said to me, you have to get on the next plane or you're not gonna get back there. And right there and then I changed my flight and um, got on the first flight the next morning and to, du to Dubai and then I was one of probably 20 passengers on a 737 flying back into Kabul that arrived um, on yeah, 2 p.m. on August 14, the day before the, the Taliban rolled in. Were you worried for your own safety at that point? Did you think that the Taliban might pose a threat to you? I actually wasn't as worried about the Taliban as I was about the, what came before the Taliban. I mean, by this point, it was absolutely inevitable that, that the Taliban were going to take Kabul. Um, it could have been a matter of hours or weeks or months, and it, there, were, there were kind of two ways it could have gone at this point. It could have returned to the kind of um, Kabul you saw in the, in the mid-90s with um, uh, the, the rebel forces, now the Taliban um, Fighting, yeah. be besieging Kabul and shelling it from the outside until the security forces collapsed, or there could have been a, a sort of somewhat peaceful transition of power. Um, and um, it, I mean, the, by the, the following morning, the Taliban had the city completely surrounded and it w there was a bit of a, a stalemate where, uh, um, where both sides sort of, you know, waited for orders. Um, the, all the um, security forces from the, the outlying um, areas were, had sort of converged on, on Kabul and were flying in from these, you know, rapidly, the, these um, uh, military bases, air force bases that were, you know, putting up a last stand as the, the planes flew out or, or, um, or you know, uh, putting down their weapons. Mm -hmm. And, um, I mean, at, at this point, uh, it was really a roll of the dice and I was just really, I mean, to be honest, I was crossing my fingers that, um, that, that, the, that the government forces would just lay down their weapons and, and let the Taliban um, walk into town, you know. And that's pretty much what happened, wasn't it? Pretty much in they, the end, yeah. They crumbled. I know there's been a lot of criticism of, of um, the Afghan military um, for, for collapsing so quickly. Do you think that's fair, though? Is that a fair criticism? I mean, they, they knew that they weren't ever going to really win this. It would have been suicidal almost to try and hold out. Yeah, they were they were really struggling by um, in those final months because they they relied so heavily on American, um, firstly air support, mm. and secondly uh, contractor maintenance of their of their aircraft and provision of their um, of their weaponry and their ammunition, and um, as the international um, military footprint started to depart. Um, the, the maintenance providers departed with them. I mean, they, they needed the protection of the, the military to, to operate. And in the, in the final weeks, it became very clear that, you know, all these, uh, these you know, dozens of Black Hawk helicopters and light attack aircraft that had been donated by the Americans to the Afghan uh, Air Force that, that comprised the total of the Afghan Air Force 
were useless without um, maintenance and, and um, slowly all these, and the, you know, the, the, as the pressure mounted, these, these aircraft were getting you know, shot out and shot and were, were, were no, no longer um, uh, able to be flown at all. And, and so the, um, that, that meant that these remote bases couldn't be resupplied and gave, no, gave the soldiers within them no chance but to, um, to surrender and um, the, the, the units that were, were still functional, they no longer had the air support that they had always relied on for the, that um, advantage over the Taliban. And, and um, yeah, in the end, it just, there were no, uh, there, there wasn't enough, on top of that, there wasn't enough morale to go around to, to maintain any defense against the Taliban, apart from, I mean, there were some government um, uh, army units that were still Operational and still fighting, but there wasn't a um, any coordinated leadership to to, to hold utilize it, it. Yeah, exactly. And there wasn't a lot of confidence in the kind of democratic, grand democratic project either. No, I don't think so. I don't think anyone. Um, I think a lot of people believed in the idea of the republic and, and democracy, but it, it it just it never it was never allowed to um, you know build up enough steam to to show the, um, the, the, the benefits, or to, for the benefits to be, to be reaped, and, Certainly not and out the of corruption, it. and um, yeah, it just wasn't a good um, example of, of the idea that that had all been sold on. Which is a real tragedy, isn't it? I mean, given the kind of moment, let's go again, as we said, back in 2001, the kind of optimism and sense of hope and renewal that, that, that we saw when the, when the Taliban first left, and the kind of opportunity that everyone saw they're in, in Kabul at that point. And I think uh, that, that's the other big theme of, of uh, or one of the reasons, one of the big reasons for the collapse of the government was the, the way they undermined their own system and through corruption and, and graft. And, and this was you know, plain for everyone to see. And I wonder, I've always wondered though whether we really tried to impose a Western view of democracy on a country, not that it was undemocratic, but you know, Afghanistan, we tried to impose a very centralized government on a country that really is, a, is almost a collection of, of, of provinces and, and remote valleys that really run themselves and, and are isolated. If you try and corral them in and, and impose a centralised authority, there's always going to be tension, there's always going to be problems in, in that kind of model. Yeah, absolutely. I, I don't need to add anything to that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, we can all yeah. go. <laughs> I've solved the problem. <laughs> um, the, you, at the time, you spent a lot of time in Kabul documenting not just the collapse of, of the regime, but documenting the stories of some really of, of some individuals that were caught up in this. And your book is a really wonderful um, mosaic of these individual stories that you weave together. Perhaps the most compelling one. And for all sorts of reasons, I think one of the most complicated ones is the story of Nadia. Um, you were busy photographing outside the French embassy when you were stopped by the Taliban. Um, they took your, they questioned you, they took, they, they ordered you to delete some of the photographs. And then Nadia, I think, as you were about to leave, she tapped you on the shoulder, she approached you. Just pick up the story from there. Tell us what, how that relationship unfolded. Yeah, I, I got marched back to my motorcycle that I'd parked a couple of hundred metres away and, and got sent on my way. And then as I started my bike up, uh, I had heard this, this small voice and it was this young woman, Nadia, um, who I'd never met before, but who'd, follow, who'd seen what had happened and, and followed me. And, you know, in, in her wily way that I would learn of later, had, you know, um, uh, Followed me surreptitiously enough that the, the, the Taliban hadn't that, that were escorting me hadn't hadn't realised and and she um, she told me that she she'd filmed this encounter that I'd had with the Taliban. She said, "Oh, you know, I saw what they did to you, and uh, do you want the, the footage? I'll send it to you on WhatsApp." And you know, I, I, yeah, I thought I you know I didn't know what it would be useful for, but I thought why not? And um, and she wasn't asking anything of me, which, which was unusual. It was unusual at that time because, I mean, uh, foreigners at that time um, were seen to have 
the Midas touch, if, if anyone could get... The, the, this, sorry, I forgot to mention, this was in the two weeks that followed the, the Taliban's return to Kabul, during which the evacuation was um, still underway at the airport. And so any time I, I was out in public, I would, I would get asked you know, constantly by people for help to get to the airport, to get out of the country. You know, they would have their documents with them. Um, you know, I, I you know, used to um, deliver water to the Americans in 2010. Here's my you know, certificate. Can you get me inside the airport? And, I mean, it was really it was, heartbreaking, huh? Yeah, it was, and yeah, just constant, constant in those and yet, days. And Nadia didn't ask for anything. She didn't ask for anything, and taking she, and just just to be mm. clear, filming was a really brave, ballsy act, wasn't it? That this was this is let's not underestimate how how dangerous that would have been for her. Yeah, very much so. But she was feisty and and cheeky, um, and yeah, so she took this risk and and sent me the photo, uh, sent me the video, and. Um, you know, I didn't think too much more of it. It was, you know, hectic those days, and I, uh, yeah, I just I didn't think too much of it. And then, um, in the days that followed, um, uh, she she started calling me, and I just I just uh, you know I didn't I didn't have time for whatever reason, and then to to answer, and then a friend of hers called me, and she said, oh, you don't know me, but you know my friend Nadia, and um, she's in a lot of trouble, and um, I'm wondering if you can can help and um, I didn't, um, you know, I, uh, in the beginning I didn't take it as seriously as I, as I should have, um, but it turned out that, that she had, um, I won't give too much away, but um, the reason she was in trouble was because her, her family was, um, was uh, involved with the government, her, her father and her brother had been with the police force and um, the Taliban had been threatening the family for probably 10 years or more. Um, and since they had um, moved from their um, province into Kabul as a way to get away from the Taliban, now they had nowhere left to, to run or hide. And so, so they, were, they were feeling very much in danger. They thought that, that, that their past would catch up with them, that the very Taliban much so. would, would come after them, would, would seek retribution. Exactly. Yeah, they, they, they thought their day of reckoning was, had arrived. And so. The, her father and, and her, um, one of her brothers sort of came up with this plan um, as a way of appeasing the Taliban to hand Nadia over as a, as a bride to a, to a Taliban fighter. And, um, and, and, it, and it wasn't until a few weeks later that, that um, I, I realised the extent to which she was you know, really in in serious danger and she was being, um, I mean, her, her brother and her father started to really like try to dehumanise her, I suppose, to kind of appease their own consciences and... Uh, there was a, a general intake of breath here and it's pretty shocking to hear that, but I'm not, again, for, for a moment excusing what they were doing, but do you have any sympathy? Do you understand what was going through that family's mind at, at a time like this? I, I suppose they were just, it was a, a desperate attempt at, at survival. Um, no, I mean, I find it very difficult to, to, um, to tolerate that. But Nadia does. But Nadia, I mean, Nadia has since forgiven her father for that, which is pretty hard to comprehend and, and says a lot about, about Nadia, who I'm sure you'll, you'll hear about in years to come. So. What happened? How did she? How did she get out? What, well, well um, let me not. <laughs> I'm just giving yeah. away the punchline. Yeah. Uh, what happened to her? Well, uh, she, <laughs> sorry, guys. <laughs> you have to buy twenty books for that. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, she. I mean, she. She ended up in hospital um, because of. The, the treatment she was, she was receiving from her family. She, she tried to kill herself. And um, once, once, once I learned about this, I, um, I, I knew that it was beyond 
um, there, there wasn't much I could do, so I, I um, enlisted the help of a friend who, who, had, who was a social worker and, and had been involved in these kinds of situations before, and she dropped everything and basically um, uh, plotted with, with Nadia's mother um, to get her out of the house. And, um, and yeah, she, she never looked back. She's out of the country now? She is. Okay. You left Kabul yourself too. Why did you decide to go? I'd been looking for a, a reason to leave Kabul for a, a few years, I think. Um, I'd, I'd, I'd get those sort of knowing looks from, from friends who would say, I think it might be time to leave. You know, one too many suicide bombings covered and um, yeah, you would, I, I remember doing it to, I remember having those conversations with friends in, in the years before and then I, I started um, being the, the object of them. Um, and, and so I kind of saw that myself as well, but um, I, you know, I, didn't, I, I liked life there and I was home and had my friends and I, uh, I, I, I felt the work I was doing was valuable and, and I just, um, I, I, I didn't really have anywhere else to go or anywhere else that, or anywhere else that I wanted to be more than Kabul. And, um, in the end, though, um, so I suppose I was looking for a reason, like a, a, a bookend to my time there, or um, you know, something that um, made uh, a reason that gave me reason to leave. And and, um, and you know, if if it wasn't the return of the Taliban, um, you know, what, what else would it have been? And, and that was both, you know, in a sort of professional sense, it it, it marked a, a huge turning point in the history of, of the country and, and for the, you know, the story as we, as we refer to it. Um, but also, and perhaps more so, the, the city that I had known and the community that I had become a part of was just dis disintegrated overnight. What do you think of the Australian government's approach to visas for Afghan refugees? Well, they, they clearly didn't act soon enough. The, the Australian embassy in Kabul was, was the very first embassy to leave. They left as long ago as, um, I think it was April last year, before any of the other embassies were even thinking about it. And so it's hard to understand why, on the one hand, they thought the circumstances were such that their diplomats were in significant enough danger that they needed to leave, but that the process for those who um, were potentially in danger because of their association with, the, with the, either the embassy or the Australian forces or, or for other reasons, um, that they didn't deserve the same treatment. But do you think we should be more generous with the visas? Well, yeah, undoubtedly. I mean, but yeah, that's a... Yeah, I mean, you know, like uh, I, I do personally, but that's that's a that's a personal um, call, I guess. Let's go back just very quickly. We've only got a few minutes left. Um, but there's something I want you to read. You've been speaking about your connection with Kabul, um, and I'm wondering if you could just read this paragraph that, that I've marked up for you. For any congregation of Kabulians, past or present, however, leaving Afghanistan, the land, was always easier than departing Afghanistan, the subject. Like schoolmates or military veterans, conversation would invariably turn to the topic in which we had a great depth of shared experience. Afghanistan, it's fair to, st it's fair to say, had shaped our identities in the way a school or a combat deployment might, but which a country itself rarely does. That was the way it felt to me, in any case, as I approached my ninth summer in, in the country. Do you still feel that way? Uh, good question, Possib perhaps not. <laughs> <laughs> do you feel connected to the place or do you feel connected to the idea of the place? 
yeah, I definitely feel connected to the place and I mean, I'm really having to force myself to stay away from it at the moment. My, my instinct is to, is to go back there now and to, um, to continue working there. And, um, but, you know, the analogy I usually use is that of a, like an abusive relationship where I need some time away and let things, let the dust settle and then, you know, maybe in a few years time we can, we can be friends again. <laughs> That's a fantastic point to wrap this up. We're out of time, but um, Andrew, it is a remarkable book. Thank you for being so open and honest, and thanks for a wonderful conversation. Ladies and gentlemen, Andrew Crawford. Thanks, Peter. <laughs>